This is Sean, Gabe, and I'm Zach, and we're presenting the cons of video games. Um, in our scenario, a recreational community center is debating whether or not they should add video games to the extracurricular program. Video games have been in development since the years following World War II, and um, they first became really popular in the 1970s and 1980s when retro gaming was at its peak. Now video games are really complex and graphically detailed, but they come with many cons, including eyesight damage, violence and aggression, and the promotion of overspending and gambling. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Michelle. I'm Hayden. I'm Jocelyn. I'm Joe. Go, 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 go. And these are the pros to video games. In October of 1958, the world of video games tra changed drastically with physicist William Higginbottom, <laughs> who invented Tennis for Two, creating a almost $3 billion net worth, as well as 3.22 billion people around the world playing video games, which leads me to the Oxford Dictionary definition of video games, a game that <laughs> electronically manipulates images and is used for entertainment as well as being produced by a computer program or a television screen. For some quick definitions, cognitive tests are core skills that help the brain learn, think, reason, and pay attention. Uh, and hippocampal is a, a complex brain structure that helps the brain learn memory. According to a study done by Medical Life Science, teens spend about three hours a day playing video games. And another study done by the Healthline says that double the amount of teens need glasses now than 10 years ago. This is because of the, um, the, the glare and UV light that comes off screens video games are played on. It causes strain to your eye, and over time, it damages them. Uh, the rec center needs to add video games to the after school programs because it'll help the students uh, become more engaged and it'll make them more excited to learn as well as make them more creative. Video games also help build teamwork and make the kids more sociable. My slide is about how violent, how video games cause violence and increase aggression. Some people believe that that video games are a good way to um, vent out anger and everything, but I believe that that is wrong. A study that was led by Craig Anderson and Karen Dill stated that brief exposure to video games can temporarily increase the, can temporarily increase the um, uh, thoughts of aggression. Another thing that was stated in the research was that video game controllers are so sophisticated that video games are so, so realistic that uh, that enhances the learning of these violent behaviors. 
Um, playing violent video games appears to cause aggression and violence by priming aggressive thoughts. So in short, violent video games are a forum that that create a learning that uh, help you learn and practice violent solutions to conflicts. In addition to educational benefits with video games, according to the National Institute of Public Health, they stated that the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development, or ABCD, researchers invested in a study to find the pros as well as cons to video games affecting children. They found that the adolescent <laughs> ABCD researchers took MRIs of children and found that the children who played for three plus hours had a higher brain activity in brain activity in regions associated with attention and memory. Likewise, in the same study, out of 2,000 kids, those who played for the three or more hours had better accuracy and quickness when dealing with cognitive tasks. And finally, in a study done by the National Institute of Aging, they found that your everyday video games such as Super Mario and Angry Birds over Solitaire actually improved hippo hippocampal-based memory of people of all ages, ranges from 6 to 60. Um, one of the biggest cons of video games is the overspending um, by players, which includes gambling real money away for virtual items, and this gambling could potentially be underage gambling. According to Statista and Super Data Research, over $65 billion have been spent in 2022 alone on in-app purchases in video games. Over 80% of these purchases were done through free-to-play games. These games present themselves as games that you can download for free fun without spending any money on them, but constantly try to get you to buy things that you had no intention of purchasing before. Video games are able to encourage learning because they are used by teachers in classrooms. They can encourage students to learn more, and they can increase uh, so 50 percent of teachers use are comfortable using video games in their classrooms and as this graph shows 38 percent of teachers use them weekly in their classrooms and over about 50 percent of them use them in their classrooms overall since video games damage eyesight encourage violence and aggression and promote gambling our group has decided that the Recreational Community Center should not include video games as part of their activities. Okay, so video, video games can improve latency time. So what is latency time? Well, latency time is just another word for reaction time. They measure latency by performing what is called a stop signal task, or SST. This works by having a participant um, react to multiple stimuli as fast as possible with and then recording the results and taking the average. This data shows the latency t between video game players and non-video game players. As you can see, the video uh, reaction time of video game players is a lot less than that of non-video game players. Reaction, having a quick reaction time can be very beneficial in life because it can, it'll, it can help during certain situations when driving or playing sports. Um, we believe that the recreational center should include video games in their curriculum because video games can improve um, memory of people from all ages and also provide several unique educational benefits. As well as encouraging students to learn more and increasing vital reaction time.
<laughs> I, uh, we all work together on each other's slides to help improve the overall, um, to prepare each other for these questions. And we actually found that a lot, lots of children actually love video games, especially that are educational, because it engages them more, as well as promoting them to want to learn more, and then eventually, yes, it brings them up in success. This is the time when you should be making notes on your page that you're reading from. Good morning, everyone. Today, we'll be talking to you about the benefits of artificial intelligence in healthcare. My name is Brianna. This is Gabe, Brady, Aiden, and this is Anthony. First exposure to artificial intelligence, also known as AI, for many Americans in the first half of the 20th century came in the way of 
computer personalities and robots in movies and TV. Many scientists came together to make this fantasy a reality and came up with what we know now as AI. Early computer programs were used to solve simple logic problems. The logic theorist was essentially the first of these AI computer programs to be created with an automated reason. It was invented in 1956 by Alan Newell, Herbert Simon, and Cookshaw. Since the development of the logic theorist, AI technology has improved drastically. It's improved so much to the point where the American Medical Association is considering using it in medical processes. AI should be used for these medical processes because it decreases physician burnout, reduces human error, efficiently solves problems, processes data faster, and allows more patients to be seen by doctors. Hi, my name is Isaac Bustles, and I'm doing the cons of artificial intelligence. Mine is unemployment. My name is Edwin Ramirez, and I'm doing unreliability. My name is Graham, De my name is Graham DeWitt, and I'm doing AI bias. My name is Jackson Leonard, and I will be doing the, the security risks of AI. AI was first, can, was, was first made by a group of, of coders and was shown at a conference in 1950s where McCarthy first coined the term AI. Around 10 years before that, Alan Turing had first conceived the idea of AI, but can I make it due to the limitations of technology at that time? AI helps doctors see more patients. This is shown in studies such as one by Phoenix Children's Hospital. In this study, an AI was run in the background to scan for malnutrition in patients. This ultimately led to an additional six to eight patients being diagnosed for malnutrition per week. Furthermore, in a study by Lancaster Digital Health, AI-assisted radiologists to see more patients for breast cancer screenings by reducing false positives. This is particularly important because many countries have radiology shortages, such as Malawi, which only has one radiologist for every 8.8 .8 million people. AI has grown to be so advanced it's now being implemented in the workforce around the world. Because of this, unemployment rates have skyrocketed. 45 million people are estimated to lose their jobs due to AI by the year 2030 in the US alone. But that is nowhere compared to the 400 to 800 million that are supposed to be lost worldwide. Artificial intelligence can decrease physician burnout by addressing two of the main complaints of our healthcare workers today lack of, of easily accessible data and administrative strains. According to a Georgetown University clinical informant, the main complaint from emergency room physicians is a lack of easily accessible data. AI has evolved to not only provide this data quickly, but accurately. Um, the second way AI can help is by automating administrative tasks. According to a national survey, our healthcare workers can spend up to 20 hours a week completing AI tasks, not AI tasks administrative tasks. And those without access to AI spend twice as much time reviewing medical records and patient histories. AI is not simply taking over one role in society. It is taking over many, such as manufacturing, transportation, and even food service. A quote by our president said in 1961 said that our main challenge with the 60s is maintaining full employment at a time when many people are being replaced by automation. A study done by Zipia.com, which is a job finding website, showed that 49% of people believe they have lost their job in the last five years due to some form of automation. And there's more jobs to be lost. Another pro is that artificial intelligence can analyze problems and generate answers much more efficiently than humans. This ability can reduce the amount of time that humans spend analyzing these problems and generating answers. Not only can AI make this a much quicker process, AI is most of the time correct when using factual data. Uh, 
I'm talking about the AI's unreliability. AI is usually really reliable, but sometimes it can't be reliable. And um, some AI systems, like the facial recognition one that the police use to find criminals, is known to be inaccurate and can um, give people jail time for stuff they didn't do. Like in a Stanford article, they had a pixelated picture of Barack Obama, and the AI system identified him as a white man, which Obama is not. And it looked, it looked nothing like Obama. And in a study AAA made, the AI in self-driving cars made an average of one mistake every eight miles under very good conditions. And AI isn't really that good of an option in a business perspective either. Because in, a, in Tech Republic, according to Tech Republic, 85% of AI failed to bring what they were supposed to bring into the business they are implemented into. AI can help us by reducing the errors we commit. Humans are naturally bad at doing repetitive tasks, completing or sorting through huge data sets, and detecting patterns. AI is good at all those things. Artificial, artificial intelligence, whether intentionally or not, can inherit human biases from the data on which it is trained. This is because the data that it is trained on could have biases put into it by the humans that did the work beforehand. For example, human bias is shown when medical treatments vary for individuals with the same ailment even under extremely similar factors. An example of AI bias is a program that was designed to assess the risk of reoffense in criminals charged with a crime. The program showed significant discrimination. A ProPublica analysis of the AI showed that the AI listed black individuals as 77% more likely to commit any future crime and 45% more likely to commit any future violent crime. The results of the AI did not line up with what happened in the real world. The AI unethically put people at higher risk even with less criminal history. Apart from unintentional bias from inherently skewed data, AI could be purposely programmed to perform unethically for the benefit of certain parties. AI can help in AI can help in medical pro, medical decisions by processing data faster than humans. Scientists may need to process hundreds of thousands of images for a single research project. Those same scientists may struggle to process the many images efficiently and comprehensively. But with the help of AI, these images can be processed faster and more effectively. The AI can also spot patterns between the images, some of which the scientists can never have spotted themselves. AI may be advancing, but that advancement may bring about the end of security and privacy as we know it. According to the, to the work to World article, the 40% of people interviewed did not trust AI, and that number might increase in the years to come. A man, a, man, a, man, a scammer had used, used AI to trick the boss of a CEO of an energy firm out of $2,430. According to a study by the FTC, a man in Hong Kong was tricked by was tricked using AI to, to, gain, to gain his money. And, and according to the same article, eight or more Canadian citizens had also combined $200,000 to to an AI voice cloning scam. And scammers are already using AI to, tr to, to, to trick CAPTCHAs and bypass them. In conclusion, artificial intelligence allows doctors to see more patients, reduce physician burnout, reduce human error, and have more efficient problem solving. Our arguments are most powerful because of the positive effects it has on society. For the reasons stated by my group mate Brady, these AI should be AI would be a huge help in major medical decisions, and its use could save the lives of millions. Artificial intelligence comes with various issues. There's risk of job loss, there's risk of unreliable functions, there's risk of AI bias, and also risk of scams and 
security risks. And this is why we believe that AI should not be used in decision-making tactics in the American Medical Institute. Thank you. Any questions? I think it did. My personal opinion. No. I'm not as complicated, but it, it, it would be a different mix of it. Like if it if we thought about it, group then we thought we would uh, get accused of something, so we didn't do it. I'd say the best way would just to be have the AI do the first set of work and then have a medical professional review over it just to make sure it's not making any decisions that are like inhuman or unethical. Firstly, I kind of agree with the con side. I think AI should definitely have a review and until it's been fully like detailed or I don't know how to describe it. I do believe AI will get better, but I don't know if it'll be conned out by its security risks, because it might be easy to breach by hackers and leak medical records.
Hi, my name is Adam. Hi, my name is Richmond. Hi, my name is Evelyn. Hi, my name is Audrey. And um, today we will, be, we will be presenting the cons of genetic engineering. So genetic engineering has actually been used for thousands and thousands of years in ways such as selective breeding and crossbreeding. Uh, but it didn't become very efficient until 1973 when two biochemists by the name of Herbert Boyle and Stanley Cohen um, took a DNA molecule from one bacteria and transferred it into another. Um, but genetic engineering um, caused a lot of advancements in science, but not a lot of them were beneficial. So our task was to write a report on the cons of genetic engineering for the World Health Organization so they can accurately update the guidelines for governments and um, health organizations. And today we will be talking about the usage of pesticides, cultural and religious beliefs, the issues of GMO foods, and um, and threats to medical practices. Hi, my name is Anna. This is Adriana. This is Adele, and this is Aiden. And today we will be presenting the advantages of genetic engineering. So the World Health Organization has decided to update the guidelines regarding genetic engineering and they have asked both sides of the argument to present and we will be sharing the first. Okay. Genetic engineering is defined as the modification of an organism's genome. This is done primarily with recombinant DNA which involves cutting into and replacing sections of the organism's DNA. Um, the technology was pioneered in the 1970s by American biochemists Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer. Their research has been used extensively in the creation of GMO, genetically modified organisms, otherwise known as GMO. GMO crops have proven to reduce the usage of pesticides in farms, as well as providing much more nutritional content to consumers. Recombinant DNA has also been used in gene therapy which has shown promising results in the treatment of genetic disorders. Um, the technology has also been used to synthesize pure human insulin, proving that it is useful in both the fields of agriculture and medicine. The first column we will be talking about today is the increased usage of pesticides. The increased usage of pesticides is directly related to genetically modified seeds. As you can see from the picture on the left, Genetically modified seeds cause a cycle of environmentally damaging pesticide crops. Um, the cycle starts when genetically modified seeds are bought. It then um, goes to pesticides being used more frequently to combat weeds that are used with the genetically modified seeds. Pesticide companies then have to create more harmful pesticides to counter super weeds, which have um, grown to um, resist the pesticides because they are being used too much. Um, the cycle then repeats with new genetically modified seeds being created to combat the stronger, more dangerous pesticide. And as you can see from the graph on the right, um, that, shows, that shows chemicals in crops being increased over long periods of time with more pesticides being used. 
and uh, the chemical is called glyphosate, and it reduces the amount of photosynthesis a plant can produce. Genetically modified crops decrease the usage of pesticides. Having a decreased usage of pesticides will help our environment and help to decrease the finances of what farmers and commercial producers need to pay. Having a decrease of this use will help us not only to environmentally make sure that the world stays safe, but to ensure that ensure that financially everybody is able to stay fine. Okay. One problem with genetically engineering is cultural and religious beliefs. In a sense, being able to alter um, the selection of life can be looked at as playing the role of God. This can be heavily um, disliked by different religious communities. In a study done by Pew Research Center in 2018, they found that 87% of people who describe themselves as highly religious um, disagreed with altering of human embryos strongly. As well as people who describe themselves as moderately religious, 69% of them disagreed with the altering of human embryos as well. When asked how they feel about using this technology to make babies more intelligent, they had an overall average of 82% of people disagreeing with this. Out of the people who describe themselves highly religious, 93% disagreed. And out of the people who describe themselves as low on the religious scale, 72% disagreed. When asked how they feel about using this technology um, to reduce um, risk of disease in babies, they had an overall average of 64% disagreeing. So gene therapy can be defined as the attempt to cure a genetic deficit through the process of cutting out and replacing a faulty gene. There's been multiple successes in this field, but one example of this is within um, sickle cell anemia. There was a trial conducted by Vertex Pharmaceuticals and CRISPR Therapeutics, which administered a CRISPR-based therapy to seven patients. And at the end of the trial, all seven patients reported less pain levels and increased levels of hemoglobin. Another example is within um, spinal muscular atrophy. So there was a drug developed called Vinraza, and this drug, it creates a neuron protein that is lacking within these patients, and over 10,000 people worldwide have been treated with this. So another con to genetic engineering is the creation of GMOs or genetically modified organisms. In today's society, around 51% of Americans are afraid that consuming genetically modified foods could cause issues to their health in the future. While this is a huge issue, the main issue though is that not a lot is known about genetically modified foods and their side effects. However, some studies do show negative side effects of consuming genetically modified foods. In a study found at the American Academy of Medi of environmental medicine, the study shows that consuming these foods could cause immune dysregulation, alter liver function, and can cause changes in the kidney, pancreas, and spleen. Um, while this is a huge issue, the um, um, the, another big issue, though, is that it could also cause um, unexpected allergic reactions or infections to a child eating these foods. Um, people are also afraid that the genetically engineered DNA in these foods could spread to non-genetically modified organisms, which causes about 87% of people globally to not consume um, or shop for genetically modified foods. Insulin is a drug that moderates the levels of sugar in the blood, making it essential to the treatment of diabetes. And for most of the 20th century, the substance was extracted from the pancreases of animals such as cows and pigs. And this led to a number of problems. One being that it created a risk for allergic reactions in patients. And another being that it was difficult for suppliers of animal insulin to meet the soaring global demand. In 1982, Eli Lilly used recombinant DNA to synthesize human insulin 
and named his product Hemolin. Uh, essentially, his bioengineers transformed bacteria into many factories of human insulin that ensured a safe and steady supply of the good. Hemolin was found to be much more pure and consistent in quality than previous animal insulins. Uh, today, human insulin has been largely phased out in favor of modern analogs, which are more convenient for consumer use. However, these analogs can also cost up to 10 times as much as human insulin, making Humulin a viable option for those who struggle financially. And overall, genetic engineering has greatly improved the insulin industry. Um, another downside to genetic engineering is its threat to medical practices. Um, because of its unpredictability, any small mistake in the process can lead to the creation of new incurable diseases being created, as well as current existing diseases becoming immune to their antibiotic. Um, a good example of this was an experiment conducted by the Russian biotech company, Biopreparat, where they created a new variant of the pathogen Y pestis, which we all know as the Black Plague. This variant was found to be more deadly and more effective and would be lethal to billions across the world if it was ever released. And it said that it could be used as a chemical weapon. Um, early forms of genetic engineering and gene therapy have also been found to lead to inflammation, inflammation, toxicity, and certain forms of cancers. And certain genetically engineered chemical compounds, such as glyphosate, have been found to increase the risk of non Hodgkin's lymphoma by 41%. Genetic engineering can help with the nutritional value of foods. Um, in developing countries, it can be hard to maintain a diet that has all of the essential vitamins and nutrients. Genetic engineering can help by genetically modifying the crops that they eat to contain everything that they need. A good example of this is golden rice. Golden rice was created because there is a lack of vitamin A in many people's diets. Golden rice contains beta carotene, which is a carotenoid that, once consumed, turns into vitamin A. Regular rice does contain beta carotene, but it does not contain it in the grain. So scientists genetically modify golden rice to contain beta carotene in the grain. This is extremely, extremely beneficial because lack of vitamin A, also known as vitamin A deficiency, can lead to things like blindness and weakening of the immune system. Studies show that per year in developing countries, 500,000 people become blind. And of those people, 50% die within a year of becoming blind. This is mainly due to malnutrition and lack of vitamin A. So genetic engineering can help these people by providing them with golden rice and genetically modified crops like it. In conclusion, after reviewing all four of our subjects of increased pesticide usage, conflicts with religion, concerns with GMO foods, and threats to medical practices, we have concluded that the cons definitely outweigh the benefits of genetically engineering things. Um, uh, our task was to write a report for the World Health Organization, and we definitely advised them to strictly update the guidelines to prevent genetic engineering from hindering uh, governments and health organizations in the future. We believe that the pros of genetic engineering heavily outweigh the cons because the cons are focused on emotion and not that. It is our recommendation that genetic engineering be permitted into society, but heavily monitored. Do you have any questions? Thank you.
Um, so do you want to know where I got it from? Okay, so I got it from the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and they did find some people that had consumed those foods with those that had formed after they had eaten them. I'm not sure. Um, so this is the cons of nuclear energy. I'm Austin. I'm Isaac. I'm Brian. And I'm Cadence. And today we'll talk about the cons of nuclear energy, and we are from Guten High School. So around 1942, a group of Fermi scientists created the first nuclear reactor. Um, and the nuclear reactor creates energy by using a process called nuclear fission, which is when you split atoms and it creates heat, which is used to make energy. We get to discuss the pros of nuclear power. My group consists of Charlie, Angus, Abdul, and Andrew, and myself, Lexi. Our scenario was, should the government subsidize the construction of new nuclear power plants. I'm going to start by telling you how nuclear power works. Nuclear power works through a process called nuclear fission. This is when neutrons collide with uranium. Uranium is split in half and this will release heat. 
The heat is then used to boil water. The steam from the boiled water is used in large turbines. One full run through of this can produce about one gigawatt of electricity. And that can be used to power over 750,000 homes worldwide. The first, you know, the first American scientist to discover, nuclear, to discover nuclear power was Enrico Fermi, who in 1942 built, created the first self-sustaining nuclear reaction using uranium ore and control rods similar to the ones depicted in this diagram. In the years following this uh, experiment, the, civilian, the possible civilian uses of nuclear power gained interest. With, with Russia and England building nuclear power plants in the 50s, and eight years later, in 1958, the United States opening their first nuclear power plant. However, in 1979, the Three Mile Island incident would bring the safety of nuclear power into question in the, in, uh, the United States. To defend our scenario, we chose the topics safety, cost, low carbon emission, capacity factor, and energy density. So I'm going to be talking about the risk of accident and there's two main nuclear related disasters that I'm going to talk about which would be Chernobyl in 1986 and Fukushima which was in 2011. Um, the Chernobyl disaster was a cause of a faulty reactor design and um, personnel and operators that were not properly trained. Um, the Chernobyl explosion and following radiation leakage caused thousands of cases of thyroid cancer and acute radiation syndrome. And the initial blast itself killed about 50 people. And then in Fukushima in Japan, um, the nuclear reactor broke down from a rare double earthquake and tsunami and it caused all power to be lost and then the backup cooling systems were down and it caused a large portion of Japan to lose power for a while. According to the Energy Information Agency, also known as the EIA, nuclear power, accounting for its cost of operation, its cost of maintenance, and its cost of fuel, is a relatively cheap source of electricity to other various sources such as fossil fuels and certain types of solar power. Nuclear power also has one of, if not the cheapest source of fuel, which is the widely known radioactive element uranium. As time progresses and technology further develops, means of creating more efficient nuclear power plants becomes more present, and the price of nuclear power per kilowatt hour gets only lower and lower. Hello, my name is Isaac, and I'll be talking about the high cost of nuclear energy. It's no surprise that a machine like this would be expensive. At an average cost of $29 per megawatt hour, this can rack in over $250,000 per year of cost. It's common knowledge that a business will stop at no expense to lower cost. And with a machine of this technological prowess, the consequences could be catastrophic. The mad scramble to make nuclear energy more efficient has been disastrous for our planet. An, an estimated 7.5% of all nuclear plants have melted down, and with 10 miles per meltdown, that's 330 miles of unusable land. Death is bad. Such an irrefutable statement, I imagine that it is in complete and total agreement among everyone gathered here today. And because death is bad, we should of course work to prevent it in all applications especially of great importance to today's discussion, power generation. And as can be seen by this diagram with data from the UN Committee on the Safety of Atomic Radiation and several scientists from the journal Lancet, nuclear is one of, if not the safest, method of power generation. On par with solar and wind, it's significantly safer than fossil fuels such as coal and oil. And this is because of three main factors. These factors being that nuclear energy does not produce harmful pollutants, unlike fossil fuels. Nuclear energy also does not produce much greenhouse gases, as will be explained later, unlike fossil fuels. And the third thing is about accidents. There have only been three major nuclear accidents in the history of nuclear power generation. One of these, Three Mile Island, resulted in zero fatalities. One of them, at Fukushima, was a result of the largest earthquake and tsunami in Japanese history. Definitely an extenuating circumstance. 
And the last one, Chernobyl, was tragic and bad, but it only happened once in 1987, over 30 years ago. Nuclear power generation technology has improved significantly since then. And therefore, nuclear energy is one of, if not the safest source of energy. Another con is that it is non-renewable. Now, this graph here shows the exportation rates of uranium of each country. Now, as you can see here, Australia here being at 29%, the highest, yet it, it, also, it is also the furthest from every single other country in the world that uses nuclear power. Now, there is around 6.1 million tons of uranium reserves left in the world, and that's only enough to last about 90 years. Now, 90 years is a very short time in comparison to human history and its future ahead. Um, also, the fact that it is a short-term um, is a short-term solution to a long-term problem, which after those 90 years would end up humans reverting reverting back to fossil fuels, and overall it creates lots of pollution and is not a good in invention to the world. Another great thing about nuclear energy is the incredible energy density of its fuel, uranium. Just one one-inch uranium fuel pellet can, is equal to about a ton of coal or 120 gallons of oil. And less than 10 of these pellets is all that's required to power the average household for a year. With hundreds of these pellets placed inside hundreds of fuel rods, inside of hundreds of fuel assemblies within a nuclear reactor, the nuclear reactor will burn through its fuel very slowly, meaning it needs to be refueled less. With refueling less, it not only produces power more often, but it's also cheaper because it requires less fuel, per, less fuel per, per year. This bringing the cost down even further. Hello, I'll be talking about um, nuclear waste. So, although um, nuclear power plants don't create any emissions, there is an issue with the radioactive waste it produces. On average, a nuclear power plant creates about 20 metric tons of reactor fuel per year, and with that comes a lot of nuclear waste. If you take into account all of the, um, sorry, if you take into account all of the nuclear plants around the world, about 2,000 metric tons of re radioactive waste would be produced per year. Radioactive waste, such as used reactor fuel, uranium mill tillings and other wastes could be very harmful. If not stored correctly, this radioactive waste could affect the environment negatively and could also impact human health in a negative way. In China, India, and Indonesia, citizens look up to see dark clouds above their heads. This is a result of the pollution from coal and gas fire power plants. Coal releases methane, but nuclear power releases no greenhouse gases. The carbon emissions for nuclear power are far lower than gas or coal-fired power plants. Nuclear power only emits about 15 to 50 grams per carbon kilowatt hour for carbon dioxide, while gas and coal will release from 500 to 1,500 grams per kilowatt hour. And lastly, um, the capacity factor measures the maximum power and how often it's at its maximum. Nuclear power is at its maximum 92.5% of the time, which is higher than any other type of energy source. Geothermal produces at its maximum power 74.3% of the time, natural gas at 56.6, hydropower at 41.5, coal at 40.2, wind at 35.4, and solar at 24.9. With nuclear being 92.5, it is at its maximum power most of the time, which makes it a better energy source, and it will produce the best energy for you at all times. In conclusion, based on the fact that nuclear energy has a high cost, there's high risks, there's a lot of nuclear waste, and the factor of it being non-renewable, the U.S. Subcommittee of Domestic Energy should not put funding into creating a new power plant and should instead put funding into researching an alternative energy source. Nuclear energy is the one solution for the energy production of the future. and Therefore, we ask that the United States House Subcommittee on Domestic Energy do ask that the government subsidize the construction of more nuclear power plants for the reasons of 
low costs, high safety, high energy density, low carbon footprint, and lastly, a high capacity factor. All of reasons that we should indeed forward the construction of more nuclear power plants for the future. Costs are lower, like from nuclear power plants, then because their construction costs have been paid off. But and I imagine there is quite a bit of like structural differences. But I was, well, my personal research is mostly into the broader scheme of what nuclear power is and its efficiency, rather than the nitty gritty construction. Oh, the technology itself. Um, Uh, seven point five percent have meltdown. I didn't come across that in my research. I only came across the percentage. I mean, nuclear power is still currently used in our power generation infrastructure, of course. There is one near us in Lake Anne. I mean, the reason why fossil fuels are currently being used is because they have been used for a long time. The fact is that it is cheaper to construct an individual fossil fuel power plant, but it is cheaper to operate a nuclear power plant because the fuel is so much cheaper. I mean, we didn't come across the cost, but uranium is found naturally in coal, soot, and coal, soot, and ash. And as we still have coal-powered fire plants, the remains of that, it can come out of it for years at a time. So when they were talking about um, uranium being hard to find elsewhere in the world, it's right under our feet. It's from coal. It is technically renewable. How the decaying of uranium and coal affect nuclear power in the future? I mean, it has been there for a long, long time, and the half-life of uranium is quite long. So it will most likely be there for a long time, enough for us to better figure out more efficient ways of generating nuclear power, or perhaps even in the future develop ways of perhaps other methods of generating power that are that are even that are just as reliable as nuclear energy. Other, yes, there are. There are, um, I believe, thorium reactors are not currently being used, but they are in development among scientists. We gotta go, guys. We gotta go. Test, test.
Hi there, my name is Grace Corbett. I'm here with Cooper Thompson, Colton Ward, and Itziri Augustine. We are here from Nelson County High School speaking to you about the pros of social media. Hi, my name is Jed Fowler. I'm Jack Stern. And my name is Conley Kemp, and we are here today to talk to you about the cons of social media. So, A parenting group wants to tell t parents how they should teach their children to navigate safely social media and networking. They need to examine all perspectives before making an informed decision to tell their children. The first form of social media was created in 1997 in New York City. It was named Six Degrees and was used to connect friends, families, coworkers, and compatible strangers. Since then, social media has advanced its websites such as Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Okay, so, okay. So, as they said, the first social media app was created in 1997 called Six Degrees. And like most social media apps we have today, it allowed users to connect with others through shared interest. So, Back to the basics, the official definition of social media is any app or online website um, that can be used to create online communities where you can share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content such as photos and videos. So in 2018, a study was done that said out of 750 teens, 97% of them use some form of social media and in 2022, over 4 billion people use some form of social media worldwide. And today, that number is even larger. Um, this chart shows that 84% of Facebook users have shared a post supporting nonprofits, and 29% of online donors say that social media inspired them to give. 87% um, of all nonprofits view social media to support their cause. And Instagram and Facebook together have raised a combined five billion to support nonprofits. Kids from around the world internationally can view this and get inspired to donate currently and in the future. Today I'll be going over today I'll be going over mental health issues according to social media. 95% uh, of all teenagers have at least one social media platform. Uh, people ages 16 to 24 on average spend at least three hours on social media every day. And the leading cause of death in people 13 to 17 is suicide. This is because of the unreal expectations set on social media of how people are supposed to look and act. Um, multiple studies show that there's a correlation between how much social media you use and increased feelings of depression, anxiety, loneliness, and suicidal thoughts. These can spiral into different conditions such as anorexia and body dysmorphia and lead into other addictions. One of the, one of the greatest benefits of social media is its ability to spread information quickly and globally. This study here is, was done in 2013 and is by the Pew Research Center. Uh, the most, it is on the kinds of news spread by Facebook, uh, with the most being entertainment with 73%. Uh, this is information such as sports, uh, video game design, new movies, and other types of recreational uh, opportunities. However, another notable percentage is business with 31%. Uh, and while that does not sound like a very big percentage, uh, there are 1.23 billion people on Facebook in 2013. So 31% is around 389 million people. Uh, another more recent example of, spread of the spread of information via social media is during the COVID-19 pandemic. People use social media to uh, spread information to find information about symptoms on this new virus. Uh, it was also used by institutions like the CDC to make announcements to the public 
about ways to protect themselves. Uh, uh, these are only a few of the examples that these are only a few of the examples that show the spread of information via social media. One very unfortunate effect of social media is addiction. According to a study done by CrossRiverTherapy.com, 70% 70, 70 of young adults and teens in America are addicted to social media. 50% of Americans aged 30 to 49 are addicted, and the average American spends an hour and 40 minutes on social media each day. This shows that America is getting more addicted to social media each day and that the effects are drastic. This is especially bad for the younger population because they're going to they're be the ones growing up with this and it's going to be part of their lifestyle. Social media has been proven to be a powerful tool in spreading social awareness. Social media platforms such as Twitter and Facebook allows individuals to quickly spread information locally and internationally. During Arab Spring, social media was used to plan protests and show support throughout the country. Uh, this graph here shows a log number of tweets in Egypt by location. It demonstrates how Twitter led to a regime change in Egypt. After journalists began reporting on the issue, the usage of social media spiked and at its peak, the president of Egypt resigned. Social media was a leading influence in the, in the way the Middle Eastern countries regained their power. OK, so I'm going to talk about tracking devices. And this title is very specific. When I say tracking devices, I mean any post or tag that shows where you are or where you live or just your general location. So I know what you're thinking. Tracking devices can be very useful in dangerous situations. but in a lot of ways on social media, they can create the dangerous situation. Because on social media, you have less control over who can see what you post because it's very easy to disguise yourself um, online just in general. And this can be very dangerous for children because a lot of people ignore the age restrictions and things recommended by these specific social media apps. So in 2022, a study was done by Screen and Reveal that showed that 70% of kids would just accept any random friend requests, whether they knew them or not. 82% of child sex crimes started on social media, and 56% of parents would share embarrassing or private information about their children and teens. This can be very dangerous because it shows personal information that can be used to trick you or kidnap you. And so another large group of people that can be affected by this is influencers. Because they share so much of their life online, it can create very dangerous situations for them. So in a study done, done by William Fox from the Simon Fraser University, he messaged influencers with followings above 5,000, and he sent them a survey. And out of the 101 people that responded to it, 67 of them said that they had received derogatory insults, and all of them said that they had been threatened both online and offline. And this makes their lifestyles very dangerous due to social media. How does social media connect people? Social media's main goal is to create an online world where people can form friendships and even connections. From chat rooms, Facebook groups, forums, and even direct messages, social media is an incredible way for people to discuss anything from political news to the latest trends. There are many reasons why someone would be online from the most common being talking to friends and family all the way to supporting good groups and causes. Social media has completely altered the way our generation navigates through even the most normal tasks. As you can see, these are most of the reasons that people are online. If you look, all of these involve connections with others, whether it's direct communication or simply seeing how others go about their lives. Social media has created a digital atmosphere 
where people can share their opinions, whether it's something they agree or disagree with. Social media is an incredible resource in spreading information globally and connecting everyone. As we've gone through this presentation, we've highlighted the issues of social media. These include these inc the effects of social media. These include loneliness, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts or actions, and self-harm. Social media can also lead to addiction, and you can be tracked on social media. In our opinion, the negatives outweigh the positives on social media. We were tasked with telling parents if uh, they should let their children have social media. And in our opinion, we don't think they should. And if they do, they should heavily monitor it, and they should use the social media restrictions for kids. In conclusion, the pros outweigh the cons, because you can use social media to advertise, spread information, start movements, and make new friends. Our decision on social media is that uh, children should be allowed to use it because it affects both their uh, educational and daily lives in a positive way. I believe there's many medical professionals that will help kids get over addictions and counselors, school counselors are great resources for cyberbullying and other issues that you find that Uh, I didn't really come up across it in my research, but I know for a fact it, it went up like 50% when, because it's a lot more easier to communicate with others over social media. Cyberbullying is a big part of that. So it's a lot easier to make fun of and communicate with others across that social media. Oh, I did not come across that in my research. However, if you give me your information after this, I would be able to provide you with an answer. While I don't know the name of these organizations, I do know that many parents, teachers, and groups have been working really hard to try and downplay the amount of misinformation spread and the amount of bullying going around. Um, if you would like more information on that, just give me your information and I'll be happy to.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Braden Murphy. This is Clara Moldenhauer, Asher Bartley, and Tony Giacona. Today, we're going to be talking to you about the cons of cell phones. But before I get started, how about a brief history? The cell phone was first invented in 1973 by a man named Martin Cooper, but really didn't take off in popularity until the 80s and 90s. With the invention of the Nokia in 1987, the invention of the flip phone in 1989, the invention of, of the smartphone in 1994, the launch of 3G in 97, the iPhone was first launched in 2005, with uh, 4G being launched in 2009, and 5G being launched in 2019, which brings us to 2023, where we have the modern day iPhone. Our scenario is a prominent member in the community has brought to the school board's attention that cell phones are a problem and it must be banned on all campus from 8 to 3 p.m. And we're going to be discussing the cons of that. Communication between cell phones starts off with a microchip in the cell phone. The microchip sends radio waves to a nearby cell tower, which then helps carry your voice from your cell phone to a nearby, to your to the person you're communicating with. Okay, my group will be discussing the pros of cell phones. I'm Cassidy. I'm Christian. I'm Carter. And I'm Caroline. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so sorry. A little background information. So the cell phone was invented April 1973 by a man named Martin, Dr. Martin Cooper, as you can see here. And his goal was to invent a cell phone that was going to be easily accessible and didn't have to be connected to a landline. Within three months, he made the first prototype of the cell phone and was able to make a call on it. So my group will be discussing the pros of this invention and why the school board should allow cell phones to be used and in general in school from the hours of eight to three. So some of the pros include communication and connection. Cell phones make communication so much easier and makes it much more readily available. Another one, emergency services and sources. Um, they provide accessible emergency services and sources such as 911 and other hotlines. And they also educate larger and younger audiences and they can promote product productivity within the workplace and within schools. So let's start. Hello, I am here to talk to you about mental health and a cell phone's effect on it. Mental health may seem like it is unimportant in a school area. However, this is not true as it can affect test scores, it can cause depression, ADHD, and students that spend five or more hours on a cell phone are 71% more likely to commit suicide than those that don't. Um, communication is one of the main pros of cell phones. Cell phones have revolutionized the way we communicate everywhere, not just in schools. Um, okay. Before our cell phones, the only way of communicating between teachers and students had to be in person or through handwritten letters sent home. Nowadays, cell phones provide app, um, easy access to applications like Canvas, which we use daily. These applications allow for teachers and students to easily communicate whether it's about new grades or new assignments. Also, for cell phones, Communication between parents and parents and teachers had to be in person or through weekly newsletters sent home. Nowadays, cell phones have access to apps like email and virtual meeting apps, which allow parents and teachers to stay connected. Um, the cell phone is a great collaborative tool. With access to apps like Google Docs and Google Slides, students can easily collaborate with each other, whether it's on school projects, school, uh, normal school assignments, or it's just on homework. And finally, um, uh, students and parents, uh, communicating between students and parents during the day is made possible by the cell phone. This communication is necessary in case of emergencies or just to coordinate a ride. Um, overall, the cell phone has a, a positive impact because it has made uh, communication and elaboration, communication and um, uh, collaboration more efficient. 
Focus is a major component when it comes to learning in the classroom, as it's impossible to effectively learn unless you have it. A study conducted by the Journal of Behavioral Addiction to what consisted of 414 participants, each tasked with solving 20 anagrams. Anagrams, of course, being when you have a scrambled amount of letters and you have to rearrange them to make a new word. Some of the participants, after solving 10 anagrams, were given a break on either a computer, cell phone, or paper, while the others solved all 20 straight through. The study showed that those who took a cell phone break scored 22% scored less accurately and took 19% longer to finish the rest of the anagrams, and scored only slightly better than those who did all 20 straight through. You can con scientists aren't completely sure why this is, but they theorize with good reason that it is difficult for the brain to switch topics so rapidly and it takes away from one's already limited cognitive ability. It, it, it's a literal brain drain. So another pro of cell phones is how um, it allows easy access to emergency services such as 911. And the cell phones allowing um, involving 911 save over 125,000 lives each year with 657,000 911 calls a day, which adds up to 240 million a year. There are also apps that can help you learn CPR and other apps that you can enter your medical information to, into. And apps that can help you monitor your blood sugar involving diabetes. And there are 1,100 of these apps on the App Store with over 28 million users worldwide. One of the main concerns over cell phones in school is cheating. In 2009, Common Sense Media conducted a survey of 2,000 teens. The survey revealed that 35% of teens 35% of teens use their cell phones to cheat in school. That was 14 years ago, when less than 20% of, of phones were connected to the internet, and only 66% of younger teens and 80% of older teens had access to cell phones. Cell phones, cheating continues to be an issue in school, and schools need to take away cell phones to prevent this. OK, I will be discussing how cell phones help education and promoting productivity So, in the workforce and in school. So I'm going to start with in the workforce. As seen on campustechnology.com, 84% um, of companies are having their employees use their personal cell phone for work-related tasks. And when they do that, they see a 34% increase of productivity rates. And the employees said, well, 82% of them said that they feel connected and, um, yeah, more connected with their coworkers when this happens or when they use their cell phones. So now, education. Education had a major setback when it had to go completely online because of COVID-19. All of the learning has to go on to phones and computers and other devices, but less with phones. And there are some very important apps as seen up on the screen, and one I would like to talk about first is Duolingo. Duolingo is a language learning app that has helped millions upon millions of people learn new languages, and at the very beginning of the pandemic, 30 million more people downloaded Duolingo and started learning new languages. Now in America, one in three people are bilingual thanks to apps like Duolingo and other language learning apps. Okay, another one is Remind. Remind is an app that helps remind students about their homework or when they have tests or when athletes have practices or games. And Remind is an app that is used in Guzhan High School every day. And along with Guzhan High School, it is also used in 80% of other schools in America every day. OK, another one, Calculator. Calculator is up there as well. So Calculator is available on all cell phones. And as of 2018, 90% of cell phone users use Calculator for their day-to-day -day life. And with time, that number has only grown. OK, a few more. 
Kendall and Libby. Kendall's up there. Libby is not, so let me tell you a little about a little bit about it. Um, they're ebook apps, and they are paving the way for various other ebook apps as well. And of a survey of 1,500 people, 37% of them said that they use their ebook apps instead or over their physical books usually. And one more, Google Classroom. Google Classroom is very important because it is an app that is used in BRBGS every day. It is used to assign work, and um, you can see when your homework's due, and stuff like that. And as of 2022, 68% of schools worldwide are using Google Classroom every day. And that's why we should, should use cell phones to educate people so that we can use them productively within the workplace and within schools. Cyberbullying is a very important problem to mention when, it, when deciding whether to keep cell phones in school or not. 70 per, um, a study that was recently conducted shows that 70% of victims of cyberbullying believe to have been bullied within the past year, and around 40% of the students believe to have been bullied within the past 30 days. Cyberbullying can be very damaging to the human mind as some victims have developed social anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, and some victims have even deleted all social media accounts in order to escape cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is a very important aspect to take into consideration and must be dealt with properly. Are the cell phone is helpful in educating students and providing information to the public. The cell phone makes many different types of information easily accessible to anyone. There's roughly, <clears throat> I'm sorry. There's roughly 27 billion types of information stored in Google, and that number grows every day. The, school, the cell phone is also helpful in a school setting because of its ability to organize students' work, provide virtual learning tools, and set helpful reminders. As of 2021, 60 million students use Quizlet, an online study tool, which is easily accessible through the cell phone. There's also many other apps that are helpful, such as Newzella, Duolingo, Khan Academy, and Google Classroom. Over 70 million people use Khan Academy, which gives you a short lesson on any educational topic of a student's choice. Another helpful app is Newzella. 90% of schools use Newzella, which is an online library, and there's, that's 37 million students, K-12, and 2.5 million teachers. Another time the cell phone was incredibly helpful was during COVID. 42 million Americans are without access to Wi-Fi or internet and are unable to use school-issued laptops or computers and have to use their cell phones. Now it is clear that cell phones affect mental health and focus, as well as the consequences of cyberbullying and cheating. It is, it is with great urgency that we emphasize that the school board ban all cell phones on school grounds. Okay. So in conclusion, this cell phone was a positive and life-changing invention which after our group has spent uh, time researching the topic, we believe the cons definitely outweigh the pros and the school board should allow students to have their cell phone on them during school hours. Um, for many of the reasons we um, researched, the first one being communication with um, multiple apps like Canvas and Google Docs, students, students and teachers can easily communicate. Secondly is uh, for emergency services, um, uh, cell phones have easy access to emergency services, which um, are a necessity during an emergency and help save lives. Um, another one is they help inform students. Apps like Quizlet and Duolingo um, help students uh, be able to learn better inside and outside the classroom. And finally, with apps like um, the Remind app, students and teachers can stay on top of their schedules and busy lives.
Um, so before I started researching, I really agreed with the con side, but then I saw that you could use your cell phone more productively and that employees really do use them and the re research showed that they were really helpful. And so I feel as a, if we learn how to use our cell phones for education and productively, then it could be really helpful and I think that'd be very good to have. Hope so. As a, uh, as a teenager, in case you couldn't tell, um, I like my phone. And uh, I can say that not a lot of people, myself included, would, have the, would necessarily have the self-control. So yes, my opinion has definitely changed, and I most certainly agree with the cons. Um, hi, today we're going to be doing the pros of drones. Um, we're from Fluvanna County. I'm Arian. Um, that's Carson. That's Brenham. And that is Charles. Good morning. We're from Madison County High School, and we, we, we will be presenting the cons of drone use. My name is Caroline, and this is Brighton, Alexis, and Autumn. A drone. It's also known as a UAV is an unmanned aerial vehicle and was first invented in 1917 during the First World War. Britain invented the drone and used it for military purposes at the time to aid during the war. In 1935, the first modern drone was invented and Abraham Kareem is known as the fa father of the drone. In 2006, the first modern drones were released to the public and in 2015, that's when they started going up in sales and going up in popularity. Nowadays, they're used for many recreational activities, day-to-day -day services, and many activities just to have fun. Uh, Congress is considering legislation to allow the use of drones in businesses, the government, and to be sold to individuals in the U.S., and we believe that drones should be used because they lessen CO2 emissions, they can be used for landscaping purposes, um, they manage time, and they can also be used to deliver cargo and packages. 
As previously stated, Congress is considering legislation to allow the use of drones domestically, and we as cons believe that the FAA should review their current stature on drone use. We will be presenting the cons of domestic drone use, such as spying, trespassing, collisions, and terrorism. The first drone was developed in 1935 and has since then become a modern household technology. I'm going to be talking about how Congress should let drones go into the public because of them lessening CO2 emissions. Drones, their primary source of energy is electricity, and in turn, they will take in less energy than, say, a delivery truck would, and will emit less harmful chemicals into the atmosphere, such as CO2. A study was done that showed drones only pr drones take in up to 94% less energy than a delivery truck or a car would. A study by Washington showed that drones only emit 70.1 grams of CO2 in the atmosphere while per, per delivery, which could be up to five miles depending on the circumstances. And a d delivery truck emits 161.8 grams of CO2 into the atmosphere per mile, which is a big difference in the whole scheme of things. Lastly, greenhouse gases per parasol were 84% lower with the drones delivering packages than, say, a car would. And this graph depicts it pretty well by showing a delivery truck being the highest on fuel consumption and upstream fuel into the atmosphere and a drone being one of the bottom ones. The use of drones is expected to grow over the years, but the laws surrounding drone trespass and definitive ways to prevent it remain unclear. In May of 2022, there were 855,860 drones registered with the FAA. It's important to note that this number doesn't include drones that can be flown without registration. The Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA for short, is primarily responsible for regulating drone use, and they've historically left control of the airspace below 500 feet to the states. Their 2015 General User's Guidance section was updated in 2018. The new edition now states that local and state governments, quote, are not permitted to regulate drone flight paths. This can misguide citizens into believing that they only have to comply with the FAA's rules regarding trespass, which is incorrect. According to a poll run by the news site Reuters, based out of New York, 42% of the 2,000 respondents were opposed to private drone ownership. This opposition is mainly based upon actions such as trespass. So uh, in addition to Carson's point about drones lessening CO2 emissions, drones are also very useful for taking topographical surveys. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, topographical refers to the general landscape and geography of a certain area. Now here I have a few different images taken from a study by Cogent Geoscience. Uh, the top two images were taken by drones and the bottom two images were taken by satellites. Now there's a clear difference between uh, both the detail and the accuracy of these images with the drone being 37.5% more accurate than a satellite. Now, some of you might be wondering why having these kind of detailed analyses is important. Well, it's actually important for a great variety of different people, including scientists and forestry managers who can use these images to prevent and things like wildfires. And it's also very important for people like EMTs and search and rescue workers because having these, uh, these accurate images of different landscapes will allow them to more effectively respond to natural disasters. Drones can cause harm not only to the user, but to surrounding individuals as well. In a study conducted from 2015 to 2020, 4,250 drone-related injuries occurred. 21% of injured people were under the age of 18, and 95% of injured individuals were treated then released with one injury resulting in death by electrocution. Hospital, hospital and businesses should use drones because, because 
hospital and businesses should be allowed to use drones because it is important for delivering cargo. As in the image shows, it costs way less time, money, and people to operate a drone than it is for someone to operate a vehicle.
in that evening, the game that has privileges are made for both them and for society. Our scenario is that the American Medical Association would like to create a guideline for parents about how much time their, ch their children should be using on the internet. This presentation will help to determine that. Internet addiction is a growing problem worldwide, especially in teens. As one study found that over 50% of teens have some degree of internet addiction. The brain scans shown beside me showed one brain of a normal group and one of internet, ad, internet addicts. Um, these were taken during a test of inhibitory control, which is how much resistance one has on impulse. Uh, as you can observe, the internet addict group has much less activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is the front of the brain and controls uh, impulse control and oh, impulse control using reasoning and logic. Uh, low inhibitory control, which obviously was shown in the internet addict group presents itself as distractedness, inability to focus, and many other issues. This has a great effect on one's social life and academics. OK, so education. Education is a vital component to the development of society as it helps better educate people about the current world problems and better prepare them for future problems. As you can see here, this was a poll done by Global Attitudes in 2014 that shows that out of 32 developing nations, 64% voted that the development of the internet had a positive impact on education. In addition to this, there was another poll done in 2017 by the Pew Research Center that showed that 73% of professors at colleges or universities voted that the internet has made their job much easier and given them much more resources to help better educate students. Without the internet, we wouldn't have the education or resources we have today. That's a very good point, but I'm afraid that may just be another promise the internet makes while our money slips through our fingers. I'm talking about online scamming, illegal consumer fraud, and distribution. See, the internet is host to scammers and malicious people who want to steal money, and teenagers are especially susceptible to this. I'm looking specifically at the holiday season, Everyone wants to get someone a gift, uh, a nice present. But without the proper education of internet safety, people and teenagers especially are susceptible to these scams. But not only are just holiday scams worse, but malicious users will go out of their way to target people. Phishing is a uh, almost a newer crime um, where a, a scammer will use a fake username of an email that's spoofing a real one and target a teenager or an elderly person who may not know to look for differences in email chains and request personal information, whether it's passwords, bank account info, and request money or worse things. These can lead to disastrous financial problems and we lose $6.9 billion each year and rising risk. Communication. The internet transfers information that used to take months to deliver. This is through instant messaging, phone calls, emails, etc. The internet also allows people to contact anyone from across the globe. Communication is the second highest use for the internet, at 53% of users saying it is their number one use. This is after finding information, which is at 56%. In a study done by the Pew Research Center, it was found that 72% of young adults, ages 18 to 29, say that the internet has improved their ability to communicate with friends and family. Over 6 billion text messages are sent every day, 1.3 million phone calls are made every minute, and a whopping 333 billion emails are sent every day. Just think about how much communication you have because of the internet. Many of your interactions would be limited without it. Misinformation and disinformation has become a significant problem due to the development of the internet and how significant 
significantly fast it travels information. Um, misinformation is when um, false news is spread unintentionally and disinformation is when false news is spread intentionally. Um, this chart here shows a survey conducted by Deloitte Insight. Here they asked about 2,000 news consumers if they were worried about um, fake news being spread. And as you can see, more than 70% agreed that it was becoming a problem. This affects teens because 70% of teens use the internet every day. And a research conducted by Frontier shows that 41% of teenagers can't differentiate the difference between real and fake news. Um, misinformation can manipulate teenagers' thoughts and feelings. The internet has revolutionized how people spend their time each day. With people on average spending up to 420 minutes on the internet per day. As you see on the chart, about 29% of that is through entertainment. That includes social media, streaming, and video games. 66% of Americans say that they play a video game at least once, once every day. 90% of Americans say that they use social media at least once every day. 92% say that they stream a video at least once every day. That is why the internet is impactful to people's everyday lives. Based on the research that our group has done on the negative cognitive effects of the internet, online scams stealing billions of dollars and misinformation and disinformation. Um, we believe, we, it is our recommendation to the American Health Association that there is a guideline established on teens' internet usage. In conclusion, we can see that the pros clearly outweigh the cons and we wouldn't be where we are today without the development of the internet. As the development of the internet has greatly influenced important factors in the world that include communication, education, and entertainment purposes. Our recommendation to the American Medical Association is to not limit internet usage time as it has positive effects and people use it in their everyday lives. We also recommend for it to be mainly used for beneficial purposes such as economical and economical purposes. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'd say the internet as a whole can be reviewed as having both uh, pros and cons. And the main problem is teenagers aren't aware of what the cons are and how to fall into them. So if used safely, the internet is absolutely for good. I didn't specifically come across that, but I'm sure that it does. Yeah. We didn't come across that either.
Hi, I'm Logan Coppedge, and we are from GHS. I'm Josh Gaskell. I'm Lindsay Burnett. I'm Luca Gardner. I'm Kyle Stamey. Hello, my name is Jonathan. This is Mia, Marlon, and Maddie. We're here to present the negative effects of fossil fuels. A little background information for fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are made of plants and animals that has been that have, are dead and that has many layers of sediment on top that is succumbs to a amount a large amount of heat and pressure. Then it later turns into oil, coal, or natural gas. Fossil fuels started being used in England and then spread to the it spread to other parts of the world. Fossil fuels is the most used most used source of energy. And there are many, there are many pro, pros that we cannot name, but here are some. The amount of energy, the energy density, and the products of fossil fuels. Millions of years ago, fossil fuels were created by carbon-rich materials from dead plants and animals. The first great energy transition of fossil fuels began around the early 1700s 
when wood was replaced by coal and charcoal. By the early 1900s, coal passed biomass to become the industry's leading fuel, taking up over 50% of the world's fuel use. Our scenario is we, want, we wonder if a group of wealthy investors want to explore fossil fuel exploration and drilling in the United States or to fund renewable energy source. Our concerns are the global warming, air pollution and its effects on children, oil spills, and fossil fuel related deaths. So one of the major pros of the use of fossil fuels is the revenue that it brings in. Right here is a graph from 1950 to 2008 that shows the price of fossil fuels over that time span. You can see how it has gradually gone up over the time span. So it was, there was a report last year that showed that $200 billion were brought in from the fossil fuel companies, and that is actually 10% of the U.S.'s um, gross that it's been brought in. And also, the U.S. can use that money from the fossil fuel companies and taxes to give out to citizens and help the U.S. to thrive. The burning of fossil fuels releases gases such as CO2 and methane into the atmosphere. This causes heat to get trapped, which increases the rate of global warming. It is believed that if this is to continue, heat waves are going to increase in intensity and frequency. It has been calculated that an estimated of 11,000 to 30,000 deaths will happen annually because of this. I will be talking about the abundance of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are found all around the world. They contribute to about 80% of the world's energy sources. The United States produces the most fossil fuels in the world. They produce about 20% of the world's fossil fuels. Russia and Iran also produce a lot of the world's fossil fuels. Many years ago, it was believed that fossil fuels will eventually run out. Now it is believed that fossil fuels will never run out. Like Mara Len said in her speech, heat is one of the main issues that comes with the consumption of fossil fuels. For all of you out here who play sports, this is bad news. According to the Corey Stringer Institute from the University of Connecticut, heat is one of the four main reasons for death in student athletes. Heat, like Marlene also said, is caused by the emissions that come from the consumption of fossil fuels. Air pollution also comes from these emissions. According to the World Health Organization, 90% of children around the world, that's 1.8 billion children, are exposed to these harmful air pollutants. According to Tyler Vanzo from the Smart Air, these air pollutants are so dangerous for children because their bodies are still developing and air pollution affects the body's way of cleaning and repairing itself. Now there are various physical and mental effects of these air pollutions on children. The New England Journal of Medicine illustrates them. The physical issues are heightened asthma, bronchitis, and stunted lung growth, as well as preterm birth and infant death. While the mental issues include attentive and cognitive issues, such as ADHD and autism, as well as heightened mental illness, such as depression in children. With the continued use of fossil fuels and the continued release of these air pollutants, more children around the world will be at risk of these issues. Okay, I'm going to be talking about energy or efficiency of fossil fuels. One of the main examples of this is energy density. Energy density is the amount of energy a fuel has relative to its weight and size. As you can see up here, natural gas has around 53.1 megajoules per kilogram, while wood, a renewable resource, has 19.8 megajoules per kilogram. For reference, in an average American home uses around 50 megajoules a day. Another example of it is that, that fossil fuels can be used at any time of the day, unlike wind and solar energy. For wind, for wind energy to be accessed, it has to be in between 8 and 55 miles per hour. So whenever it's lower than that, wind energy cannot be used. For solar, it has to have sun has to be directly hitting the solar panels. So when it's night or cloudy, it doesn't it can't be accessed. All while fossil fuels can be burned any time of the day. 
Crude oil is the ancient remains of plants and animals that have been buried beneath the seafloor for centuries. For all companies to harvest this, they must drill beneath the seafloor and pump it up to ships using pipelines or other sorts of transportation. Then from there, tankers take it to a processing plant to be refined for everyday use. This is where oil spills can happen. According to the NOAA and IOT, ITOPF, oil spills happen thousands of times per year in the U.S. And per decade, six tons of oil are spilled. This affects marine wildlife and ecosystems in two different ways. Fouling is physical damage, such as bird getting oil on its feather, which makes it unable to fly, or sea being stripped with protective coating, which makes it susceptible to hypothermia. Oil toxicity is toxic damage, and this causes things such as immunity problems, heart damage, and even death. This ruins ecosystems and sea-based economies for decades on end. An example of this is the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989, which spilled 11 tons of oil into Alaskan seas. Forty years later, this effect is still being felt, and some areas of the sea are unable to swim in, and fish can no longer live in them. I'll be talking about how much energy globally is produced by fossil fuels. As you can see in this pie chart, gas, coal, and oil make up over 80% of the world's energy produced by 80% of the world's energy produced. This far outweighs the amount of energy produced by nuclear energy, hydroelectric energy, and the other forms of nuclear, or sorry, other forms of renewable. In fact, even if you were to combine how much energy nuclear energy, hydroelectric energy, and all the renewables make, it does not uh, make as much energy as any one of the three fossil fuels shown here. Another negative impact of fossil fuels is shortened life expectancy. In a study conducted by the University of British Columbia partnered with the Washington University of St. Louis, they found that over one million Americans die annually from our use of fossil fuels. When looking worldwide, there are more than eight million, Ameri eight million people that die as a result of our consumption of fossil fuels. In another study conducted by the University of Delaware, they found that when ranking the 25 most dangerous jobs in America, coal, coal, oil, and gas mining was ranked third most dangerous because of its death by employment rating. In this graph, you can see that this, this graph illustrates the number of deaths per terawatt of hour and en of energy produced by each of these resources. The resources at the top are all fossil fuels, which generate anywhere from three to 25 deaths per terawatt of energy produced. The bottom resources are all renewable resources, which generate less than one death per terawatt of energy produced. In conclusion, without a decrease in our consumption of fossil fuels, there will be a shortened life expectancy because of pollution. Life without fossil fuels. 46% of all, of all uh, fossil fuels go straight to energy. That leaves the other 54%. 10% of that 54% is plastic. Things such as medical supplies, makeup products, pl plastic, asphalt, cleaning supplies, that, that's where all the other 54% go, obviously. So imagine your life without the necessary medical supplies or the necessary cleaning supplies. How will we say sanitary and also makeup? In conclusion, if a group of wealthy business owners were looking to fund the consumption of fossil fuels, but were on the fence of whether or not they should fund it, they shouldn't. They shouldn't because of global the emissions, increasing the rate of global warming, polluting, causing negative effects on children, oil spills causing harm to the environment, and a shortened life expectancy for, for those who farm the materials. In conclusion, the main reasons that we think a wealthy group of investors should invest in fossil fuels is their abundance, their energy production, their energy density, the cost of fossil fuels, and the different products that they can make.
So from Harvard, um, there was a source that said that coal reserves have risen 75% in the last 30 years. So it'll take, if they do run out, it will take a long time. But by the time the resources we have right now run out, we will have more. Um, I saw this thing where they took different plastics and they molded them into kind of like brick, like large brick tiles, and they would lay them out to make roads in just indigenous populations. Oh, sorry, but it is very good for the economy. Honestly, it's faster and overall it might even be cheaper. I don't, I didn't do much research into how much fossil fuels ended up costing. Sorry, not fossil fuels, uh, renewable energy. Oh. Wait. You had a question? I would probably say that if we were to suddenly stop using fossil fuels, that nuclear energy would probably be the next best thing to turn to because it's not super dangerous and it does make a fair amount of energy, especially when compared to like hydroelectric, which doesn't really make much, even though it's efficient. Yeah, I would agree with that. The nuclear would be the next best option, um, uh, especially in like the safety and the efficiency levels. Like Andrew said in his speech, the uh, death of nuclear is gradually less than that of fossil fuels. Thank you. We, uh, sorry. Um, we are the um, cons of factory farming. I am Kara. I'm Lila. I'm Mai. And I'm Casey. Um, livestock farming has been around for thousands of years, but 
the method of factory farming has only been around for about 200 years, but in that short amount of time, it has caused a great decline in the health of humans and our environment. Of all meat consumed in the United States, 99% of it is factory farmed. This type of meat is heavily processed and has had harmful effects on humans and our environment. While factory farming is more efficient and cost effective, is it worth it at the lives of the animals and the cost of our environment? In our scenario, we were asked to, see, to look at the pros and cons of locally grown food being the priority in grocery store chains. My name is Marcus Graver. This is Isaiah Turner, Lily Perry, and Kai Garcia Lawrence. We're from Nelson County, and we'll be talking about the pros of industrial farming. Uh, industrial farming is pretty much the large scale production of livestock and agriculture. Industrial farming was started during the mid 1800s and uh, right. in our scenario we were presented with the task of helping a new grocery store chain decide whether to use traditional farming or industrial. And for the pros we listed greater efficiency lengthened food availability, created jobs, and cheaper food. One of the cons of factory farming is the animal cruelty that goes into it on a daily basis. One example of this is the mutilation of animals that happens to them in order to make sure they don't harm each other in captivity. This includes tail docking, horn removal, and beak trimming, which is cutting off one half to one third of a chicken beak, which to prevent them not pecking each other in cages. Add to this, the life that they live is not a great one, to say. Um, they are kept in small cages to maximize the amount of animals they can have. And they also are subjected to other horrible things. Young are often separated from their mothers at a very young age, ranging from in the womb, in some cases, to even a few hours old. It, another thing that happens to them is the way that they are put down is cruel. Though there have been laws to make sure these animals aren't suffering while they meet their untimely end, um, these laws are not foolproof. The, Way chickens are commonly killed, which I'll use an example, is there's live shackle slaughter. Live shackle slaughter is when a chicken is suspended by its feet on a metal conveyor belt. It is dunked into a vat of electrically charged water. It has its throat slit when it is rendered unconscious by the previous slaughter and then is dunked into a, a tub of boiling water to remove the feathers. But if a malfunction were to occur, the chicken would be very conscious during its demise of getting its throat slit, or even worse, it could be boiled alive if the mechanical blades do not function correctly. A major pro in the argument of factory farming is the efficiency it involves. Factory farms are much more productive than any other form of farming. In my graph, you can see the pounds of meat produced annually over a 50-year increment. As you can see, the efficiency has risen significantly since the 60s. Nearly 99% of meat produced nowadays comes from factory farms alone. And 23 million animals are produced daily, which just goes to show how efficient factory farms are and how good they are at supplying nutrients for our country. Okay, so factory farming is one of the most harmful causes of pollution in the world. In total, all animals involved in factory farming in the United States produce over 1 million tons of manure per day. For example, a factory farm in Illinois dumped over 200,000 gallons of pig manure into a local river, killing over 100,000 fish and other forms of marine life. Furthermore, it is believed that male fish in both Maryland and West Virginia have developed ovaries as a cause of the manure and pollution being dumped into their habitat. Factory farming also affects our air. Uh, factory farming is at um, is the cause of 66% of human-related nitrous oxide in our atmosphere. Nitrous oxide has 296% more of a potential of causing harm and speeding up the process of global warming compared to carbon. 
And finally, according to World Animal Protection, factory farming is at cause for 33% of all agricultural-based methane emissions and 13% of the United States total methane emissions. Thank you. Americans consume around 274 pounds of meat per year on average, and due to the high demand of animal products, uh, factory farms produce large quantities of animal product, so consumers have enough to last them until they want or need more. Seasonal, seasonal livestock is also taken into consideration. Uh, an example of this would be chickens. Chickens are uh, harvested and mass produced during the limited time they are available or best harvested at and are they produce enough to last them through the next season. Um, as you can see on the chart on the right, it shows the amount of chickens sold uh, through 2019. Uh, local farms are also known for producing large amounts of seasonal livestock so they have enough to last them. Um, and due to there being so many local farms, uh, they have enough to last them. Uh, as you can see on the chart on the left, it shows the scale of small farms to larger, larger industrial farms, such as factory farms. Um, however, um, factory farms, as my uh, group member said, um, they produce 99% of uh, the total product that comes in local grocery stores. So that needs to be taken into consideration when talking about the well-being of a grocery store. Another con of um, factory farming is antibiotic overuse. Um, this practice is used worldwide in factory farms to prevent the spread of infection in cramped animal housing facilities and as a way to speed up growth in the animals. Of all antibiotics sold in the United States, 80% of those are used in factory farms. This has caused concern from health officials worldwide because um, antibiotic resistance in animals due to antibiotic overuse can be transferred to humans via food. For example, if someone was to eat eggs or slightly undercooked drumsticks from a chicken resistant to penicillin, then that person could also potentially become resistant to penicillin. This has caused major um, concern from um, medical communities because if humans become resistant to antibiotics, how will medical providers be able to treat infections? Imagine returning to a time where someone could lose their hearing from a simple ear infection or have to be hospitalized because of an infected cut. Thankfully, studies have shown that if antibiotic overuse is reduced, then the resistance effects can be reversed in animal and human populations. As the population grows, so does the demand for jobs, and industrial farming may be the solution. The chart shown here displays the US farming employment rate. The bar on the left shows traditional farming, while the bar on the right shows factory farming. Traditional farming supplies 1.3%, or around 4.4 million jobs of all US employment, while factory farming provides 10.5%, or around 35.7 million jobs. As you can tell, traditional farming has eight times less jobs supplied than factory farming. Next, worker conditions. Factory farm workers are constantly exposed to manure, toxic fumes, diseases, um, loud noises, and harmful machinery. The factory farms themselves are often unsanitary as the effort of cleaning the entire building would be too much work. The machinery are still dangerous despite their, um, despite their advancements and harm or cause people to lose limbs a lot during the years. Despite all these conditions, factory farm workers only make an average of $23,000. They are constantly covered in grime and harmed by the terrible animals, yet they do not get paid enough. Uh, around 72% of all factory farm workers are immigrants from other countries, as the threat of deportation would make them less likely to speak out about the abuse. Many of them also do not speak English, so getting another job in the United States would be very hard for them. An example of these are on January 6, 2021, in Gainesville, Georgia, six 
workers of a factory farm were killed due to a nitrogen leak. The farm in question had violated the conditions for their farm four times in the past decade. However, due to the amount of money they make, the farm was kept up. Five out of the workers who were killed were actually immigrants from another country. Lastly, the effect factory farming has on mental health is astronomical. Many of the factory farm workers develop depression or anxiety as a result of the constant abuse they faced in these situations and the killing of the animals that they see daily. Arguably the most important feature of factory farms is the ability to produce food at a vastly cheaper cost than their traditional counterparts. Though some may say that, you know, the animal welfare outweighs the amount of food that you can produce, what we really care about are the people and the communities that they serve. For instance, eggs produced by factory farms are half the cost of those produced by smaller farms. Similarly, uh, milk produced by factory farms are two-thirds the cost. This goes to help end world hunger, whereas, you know, we don't really care about animals. In summary, the cons of factory farming are the animal abuse, the environmental damage, the antibiotic resistance, and the worker conditions. In our research, our group has concluded that the pros do not outweigh the cons. Okay, and going back to our original scenario, we think the grocery store should stick with the locally grown and organic option if they truly have intentions of providing their customers with the safest and best quality food. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Awesome. In conclusion, In conclusion, factory farming is essential because it produces food more efficiently and cheaply and creates jobs and, you know, lengthens food availability. Based on the evidence shown, our group ha recommends that the grocery store chain sticks to factory farming to source its food from. Thank you. Is there any questions? Okay. Okay. So your question is, how is it still legal? Um, well, we live in a consumer world, basically. So I think, although it's morally wrong, I think a lot of people, and it is more important to get food on people's plate. I will say that. But I think that definitely outweighs it to the government, and they can't shut them down if they're making more money, you know? Um, I think so, yeah. Um, the study done in Denmark, which I referenced in my um, presentation, was there was a certain antibiotic that was used in pork, and they banned it and because they had started to see humans showing up with resistance to that specific antibiotic, and eventually um, they banned it, and within three years, all resistance to it had disappeared from, excuse me, from humans. So I think my answer is yes. It could potentially be transferred depending on which antibiotics are used um, by factory farms. Yes. Um, I didn't see that in any of my research, but that's a very interesting question. I will have to look that up.
Um, I think that's probably a very good thing. Um, I, I don't know when they did that because I didn't see anything about it when I was researching, but, hmm? well, I hope they pass it because that would really help. Um, I, I can't really talk about that. I've been a vegetarian since birth, so I'm going to let the I'm sorry, I could not hear your question. Could you restate it, please? Um, not necessarily me as a whole, but I will say uh, moving towards grass-fed and other forms of, like that and moving away from factory farming. My family has mainly done that for years, so I've always experienced. It definitely made me more aware of why we've always done that. I would say yes. Could you restate that, please? Sorry. Um, I think we got both. I think it's a, it was pretty even. We, um, a big thing for me was there were many websites with like lists of both and tried to go not so biased. But I didn't go to any farmer directly, but I think we did pretty even research. I have not heard anything about that. I believe that there is a certain animal, like a few animals are put aside during the breeding process for breeding specifically. And once they are um, old enough and ready, they will be used for breeding animals only. Be this guy. Be this guy. Good afternoon, my name is JC, and I'm here with Jeshley, Haley, and Lily from Madison County High School to present to you the cons of fracking. Okay. 
A board of supervisors for a small local community are curious as to whether they should allow hydraulic fracturing in the area and want to hear a full report from both sides. Hydraulic fracturing, or more commonly known as fracking, has been commercially used in energy production purposes for almost 60 years. It all began with George P. Mitchell and the Mitchell Energy and Development Company, who first introduced the process to the U.S., leading to an energy revolution. Since 2012, the U.S. has been producing more gas and oil than any other energy-based country, like Russia or Saudi Arabia. Fracking has been very impactful in the energy production everywhere. There are both pros and, pros and cons to it. The cons we will be addressing here today include economic impact, decrease of air quality, loss of animal habitats, and an increase of earthquakes. Good afternoon. Um, we are from Pavana County, and we are here to present the pros of hydraulic fracturing. I'm Colton. This is Hayden. That's Chris. And that's Haley. Our scenario today is we are a group of hydraulic fracturers that are here to present to a board of supervisors why they should allow hydraulic fracturing in their community. In short, fracking is a method of creating new and improving existing gas and oil wells by drilling holes into the ground and injecting water and chemicals into them. My side is on the economics of fracking. Behind me, there is a picture of everything that goes into fracking. And to start this process, it is one to two million dollars. Um, I learned through my research, through the Environmentals of America, to clean up the pollution from fracking, it is three to four billion dollars. This money could be put to much better use in other places. Fracking, it, fracking is a very efficient method of producing oil and natural gas. As of 2005, before fracking had truly become popularized in America, although it had been used for many years, we could produce roughly 5 million barrels of crude oil per day. 17 years later, in 2022, after that production has, the technology has increased, and our knowledge of fracking has increased, that number has gone up to 12 million crude um, barrels of oil per day. That's over double. Um, also, another benefit from fracking is it can produce natural gas. Um, because of fracking mainly, America has be gone from the fifth highest producer in the world in natural gas to the first, as fracking is responsible for 70% of the United States natural gas production. Um, fracking can, being able to produce this much oil and natural gas efficiently allows for cheaper prices, because as supply overtakes demand, the price goes down. And it also can allow for economic security and energy security. Due to the procedures of fracking and its involvement with um, gas and oil, fracking causes many pollutants to be released into the air, such as benzenes and xylenes. According to Yale School of Public Health, greenhouse gases such as methane produce toxic chemicals into the air every single day. And the leakage rate goes as high as 7.9%. Fracking increases ground level ozone levels, which puts people more at risk for asthma and other health respiratory issues. Another benefit, of, another benefit of hydraulic fracturing would be the creation of jobs. Due to the innovation of fracking, millions of jobs have been created. And the most common estimate is provided by the API, also known as the American Petroleum Institute. They predicted that approximately 2.5 million to 11 million jobs were created. This helps the unemployment rate go down in communities that allow hydraulic fracturing by approximately 2.4%. This also helped North Dakota get the lowest unemployment rate in the nation, as well as the fastest growing income in 2013 of approximately 7.1%. Texas is the highest producing state, which is why it's crucial to hydraulic fracturing. It created approximately 3.2 million jobs. And according to Rick Perry and David Dewhurst, the former governor and lieutenant governor of Texas, Texas has regained all lost jobs during the recession and it is important to note that hydraulic fracturing has been prominent in this community for the last few years.
Another con of hydraulic fracturing is the loss of animal habitats. Studies have shown that gas and oil operations can lead to loss of animal habitats, species decline, migration disruption, and degradation. Uh, the cause of this is losing ground from the process of fracking. As more rural areas become industrialized with each new well pad, it's associated and fractured vital habitat for wildlife can be altered or destroyed. As more species decline, they are taken out of the food chain. This can damage the population. Cleaner source of energy from the much more common coal. Based off a study done by the U.S. Department of Energy, hydraulic fracturing creates 16% less carbon dioxide, 17% less nitrogen oxide, and 62% less uh, sulfur dioxide. It's also at also good at creating pollution displacement. Even though it may release some methane gas, it makes it so no one type of pollutant becomes too prevalent and keeps us from saving our world. The result of hydraulic fracturing is increased earthquakes, especially in central U.S. states where fracking is more consistent. Scientists working with the U.S. Geological Survey have seen over 1,000 earthquakes with an amplitude of 3.0 or higher in 2015 which is a noticeable increase from the previous years when fracking was not permitted in the area. Thomas Giernon, an associate professor of earth science at the University of Southampton, has found that the wastewater that results from fracking has opened previously quiet fault lines in the state of Oklahoma, leading to a surge of earthquakes. That's one of the earthquake cause. If we, were allowed to, if we were to allow fracking in our community, we would have access to a greater amount of oil and fuel, and that would help decrease the prices of fuel in our community. Additionally, having fuel produced locally would decrease or would remove the need to purchase it from outside sources and reduce the chances of price spikes or fuel shortages. In conclusion, we think that fracking has a very harmful impact on our economic standpoint, air quality, animals, and earthquakes. For the reasons previously stated, we believe that the county should not allow fracking to happen. In conclusion, hydraulic fracturing should be added to your community because, one, it helps increase the quality and quantity of fuel production. Two, it is a great coal alternative. Three. It helps get more fuel out to the people and consumers so that they get to pay less. And four, it helps increase jobs and helps the unemployment rate go down by I didn't really dive into working conditions. I'm more concerned about the numbers at the moment, but I will dive into it later and get more information to help provide it to you. Um, in my research, I found that Oklahoma, like, as I stated in the thing, is one of the states that has, like, the most earthquakes, but it was also in Texas and Pennsylvania a lot.
Good afternoon. My name is Zach Carter. This is Savannah, Riley, and Lent. We are here to present the negative effects of the collection of personal data. Personal data is defined by the European Commission as any information relating to an identified or identifiable living individual. Personal data has been collected since the 1980s due to companies wanting to use database personalization to produce better selling products. This act, however, has quickly evolved into the mass storage and collection of personal data by both companies and the government. There's been numerous times the government and these companies have failed to protect our personal data, invaded our privacy, and left our technology and security vulnerable and insecure. Today, we are here to present to this committee the cons of personal data collection and why safeguards are a necessity. Hello, my name is Caitlin, and this is Madison, Gage, and Malachi. Um, a, an appointed committee would like to discuss the collection of personal data. And they would like to examine the pros and cons before giving any guidance. In the 1980s, personalized data collection began. At first, it was nothing big, just direct marketers trying to make their business the next big hit using, using uh, database personalization. Today, hundreds of thousands of big corporations, such as Apple and Google, collect data on people worldwide. So there are many pros and cons to the collection of personal data. We will be arguing on the side of pros. These pros include um, aid in criminal cases, background checks for the workforce, terrorism, prevention of terrorism, and um, terms and condition agreement forms. Okay, my name is Riley and today I'm going to be speaking to you about the security issues of personal data. There are many security issues with personal data. Companies and the government make individuals provide information about themselves online, but never take into consideration what can happen if it gets in the wrong hands. This is the issue. Edward Snowden is a prime example of this. Edward Snowden was a 29-year-old man that stole NSA documents from the government. Once he got these documents, he copied them and leaked them all around the world. These documents contained multiple global surveillance programs of people that only the government was supposed to see. He did this by using login credentials and passwords provided by colleagues at a spy base in Hawaii to get this information. This can't keep happening. The committee should add guidance for personal data so our information and the government's personal information can't be logged into and stolen. This is why security issues are a major problem and why we need to take that into consideration. It is widely known that um, Everything you do online can be traced back to you. So you have a digital footprint. This footprint can be used by in criminal cases, um, in criminal cases, and Um, law enforcement, such as the FBI, can use sensors that give information on where you're going and when, um, places you frequent, and even how you hold your phone. They also use tracking. Um, but a study conducted by Carnage Mellon University shows that some users' phones are tracking you every three minutes. This can be extremely useful in criminal cases ranging from as big as drug deals to as small as theft. 
We need safeguards for personal data collection as it is an invasion of privacy. In 2013, Edward Snowden exposed the NSA surveillance of innocent US citizens' personal data. He also brought light to the PRISM program, a program that forced private companies into allowing the government access to servers containing personal data. While the government stressed they had to request the data, by law, companies could not reject the request. Now, companies do not need a request to give away personal data. They already tend to do this on their own. In his own TED Talk, Kurt Grogan, a marketing specialist, speaks on how personal companies get with your personal data. Grogan presents a specific case regarding women. By tracking location and purchase history, along with other types of personal data, companies can tell a woman is pregnant before she herself is aware. This type of knowledge is a blatant display of privacy invasion using personal data collection. To set the stage for the following arguments. 1,500 terrorists, criminals, and fugitives, persons of interest and or missing persons have been identified since the launch of Interpol's facial recognition system, facial recognition system in the end of 2016. Facial recognition, facial recognition has been proven to be more accurate than humans in identifying an exact match. The personal data needed in facial recognition is the distance between your eyes, the distance from forehead to chin. The government can use personal data to locate terrorists through the internet. The misuse of data could jeopardize civil liberties if privacy agencies could use this data to create patterns and neutralize potential terror attacks. It is worth the trade-off. To set the stage for the following arguments, a 2022 IPSOS poll proves that the average American is both worried about the status of their personal data and also unaware of what methods to take to protect it. This is supported by a 2013 series of events in which Edward Snowden, a computer, a computer intelligence consultant formerly employed by the National Security Agency, released thousands of classified documents as well as a large amount of highly confidential information related to the amount of personal data being collected by the government at that time. In a more recent example, a large banking company known as Banking of America has been made victim of a cyber attack which resulted in the release of nearly 4 million customers' personal data such as financial information, user ID, and bank account balance. Following the arguments that I have stated, the collection of personal data leads to an increase in technological insecurity and vulnerability of consumers. In the U.S., there is approximately 1.238 million violent criminals that walk the streets every day. Without background checking, these violent criminals could be working alongside you in your workplace. Personal data collection allows for accurate background checks to be conducted by businesses to prevent violent acts from being committed. A study has shown that 75% of all employees steal from their employers. If background checks are conducted by businesses, this can prevent these acts from being committed and ensure that businesses will not be wronged by violent criminals. In 2023, $10.2 billion dollars were lost and stolen caused by identity theft. One of the key issues with the collection of personal data is the ability of how easy it is to find and use information against others. I believe that's been a problem since the late 1990s and early 2000s. The impression of identity theft is often caused by fraud, generally resulting in financial gain to the impersonator and financial loss to the individual. There are many risks given along with identity theft, including uh, leaks of personal information that, if given to the wrong people, can lead to bad things. In 2023, a prime example of data theft occurred with the famous social media app TikTok. TikTok was allegedly collecting information about facial characteristics, close, lo close contacts, locations, and selling it to the Chinese government. By adding a new guidance for personal data, this can help solve the issue of identity and data theft. We have all signed a terms and conditions agreement form. What are the terms and conditions? A terms and conditions agreement form refers to a digital and or physical copy of a form that gives a certain company and or corporation rights to a consumer's personal data for advertising purposes. Let me clarify what I mean by advertising. Certain corporations or companies will use 
a consumer's personal data for advertising purposes if they have signed the terms and conditions. Many consumers might be uncomfortable by the prospect of corporations using their personal information for advertising. Most understand this, but if we look at the Consumer Review Fairness Act signed by the FDA, it gives the company certain rights to have access to a consumer's per intellectual data if they sign it, according to the FDA. But before I move on to my conclusion, I, must, I would like to conduct a study. Please raise your hand if you have thoroughly looked through the terms and conditions and clicked, yes, I agree. Please raise your hand. Please raise your hand if you just go on and click it. I agree without. Thank you. Let's move on to our conclusion. Based on the information, based on the information we stated in the previous slides, we can now con conclude that the committee should add guidance for personal data collection. Savannah, Zach, Lent, and I have all provided examples of this. These examples included security issues, invasion of privacy, technological risk, and data and identity theft. It is known it was important in our presentation, as you showed why we should add new guidance for personal data. Including all the issues we've touched on, Edward Snowden hacked into the U.S. federal government, stole and leaked U.S. confidential documents for the whole world to see that only the government should have access to. This shows why we should add a new guidance for personal data so our information does not get into the wrong hands. For, in our conclusion, since personal data has helped law enforcement with cracking criminal cases from small to from small town crime to organized crime. The Privacy Act of 1974 was designed to protect the records, the privacy records that the federal government create and uses. The federal government has put in laws to, to prevent the usage and transfer of identifiable data. Since personal data has all these fantastical pros, such in background checks, Ter prevention of terrorism and um, helping aiding with criminal cases and term and the terms and conditions. We must urge political officials to allow the abstraction of personal data if if it allows the governments to have a better concern for public safety. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck up. Um, yeah. It is true, I do believe that. But as I said before, if you are willing or if you are willingly to give away your personal data to a corporation, your personal data is your responsibility to uphold. If you are willing to sign it and then give it away. Yep. During the, when you were talking about saying your recognition, all I could think about was that goes, the moment you give up your safety or your freedom, that's the moment that you expose. I was just wondering, and of course in this situation, freedom means privacy, but I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on something like that? Well, if it protects you, wouldn't it be beneficial to yourself? Any more questions? Uh, yeah. I would say that it's good because Say if there was a dangerous criminal around that was, no, not Obama, but say if there was a dangerous criminal around that offered a danger to public safety, it would have been more beneficial, not beneficial, it would be more convenient for a camera to easily identify him instead of someone in the police force that have to look around and find him. Any more questions? Um, I would like to ask, do you believe there should be any limitations or should the government and companies just be allowed to do whatever they'd like with your personal data? I would say there should be some limitations, yes. But again, again, 
then again, as I said, if you are willing to sign it, assuming these companies assume that you've read through it, and if you agree to it, then as I said before, it's ultimately your responsibility. Yep. That is true. I will say that is true. But as, per, as facial recognition has, will evolve in the future, I would say that it would get better for our future. Yeah, I do believe that that should, that should be true. Any more? Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, um, <laughs> Lila, Noah, Riley, and myself, Reagan, are going to be talking to you about the pros of robots in the workspace. With that, our summary is, an old manufacturing company is looking to invest in robotic, man robotic manufacturing, and it wants us to tell them the pros of the situation. Robots were first introduced in the 1950s by Wensington House Electric Corporation. This was the, one of the first times that robots were used in an industrial manufacturing place. Oh no, I forgot. Um, though there has been some apprehension towards robots over the years, they have proved useful in these environments. They promote safety, productivity, all the while creating new jobs and making sure every product is uniform. These are some of the topics that we will be talking with you about today. Hello, everybody. Our group will be on the cons of robotics. My name is Luke. This is Meredith, Chanel, Michael, and Tarver. And we will be talking about the cons of robotics. All right, introduction. This is just kind of a background history on some of the robotics. Uh, the first inventor, the first person who created the first robotic arm in 1954, his name is George C. Duvall, and he was born in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Why did robots become so popular? Robots became popular after the world wars due to, their, due to the world wars high mortality rates. There were more jobs than there were employees. A second reason is the explosion in the automobile business. They needed extra help. The invention of robots was important because it further propelled the, the world into the future of technology, education, production, and invention. But this begs the question, should we be employing robots in the workplace? The cons are extensive. If for no other reason, the use of robotic manufacturing equipment in factories helps guarantee consistency and quality among products. In companies such as Hexagon Fab and Ford Motor Company, the use of these, this equipment helps meet their high standards of quality. Specifically, Hexagon Fab, a micromanufacturing company, uses these to manufacture microchips. Whereas a human cannot make repeated, tiny, precise cuts repeatedly on such a small and intricate scale, a robot can do this easily when, mic when manufacturing microchips. And by implementing robots in your factory, this will help your, your company have consistent and high quality products just like ours and create a company and product that everyone can trust. So the first con is security risks. Robots are responsible for tons of data, information, and programs. With today's technology, people have been learning how to hack and infiltrate these systems. In 2020, in Taiwan, there was a cyber attack against a large IoT manufacturer, Adventech. In this cyber attack, the attackers stole an undisclosed amount of information. The attackers then held this information for ransom, demanding 750 Bitcoin from the company which is about $14 million. This company ended up having to pay the $14 million to the attackers. Not only did the company, not only did this cost the company $14 million, it also costed the company months of progress. Today I have the opportunity to talk to you about the production advantages and robots. So for this, I'd like to share with you a real world example about how robots can help the productivity in the workspace. A company located in central Virginia recently purchased a robot that boomed their company. It helped increase productivity rates, save time and money. For example, the company does um, culvert pipe restoration and they um, recently did a project that was a pipe that was 200 by 46 linear foot long. And it would take a four-man non-robot crew six days com to complete spraying with 1,700 gallons of material that would be used. But with a three-man robot crew, it would take three days to spray, and it would be only using 1,190 gallons of material. That's 510 gallons of material that would be saved due to the robot's more consistent coverage. With the price of material being at $37 a gallon, that's $18,870 saved just because of the robot. That's not including cost because the costs that were being cut from the three-day span that would be taken away, it would all add up to a total of $30,870 that would all be saved because of the robot. With that, it shows that production rates increase because of the robot and it will decrease time and money spent. One of the many cons of uh, robots entering the manufacturing workforce is job displacement. Job displacement is one of the main worrying costs about uh, robotics entering the workforce. Studies show that around 2% of jobs have already been replaced so far by robots, and by 2030, over 20 million jobs will be replaced, which is around 8.5% of the manufacturing workforce. This, uh, this uh, graph right here shows just how many jobs have already been replaced. There are some countries that are going up, but it's not very many. As you can see, some of the biggest manufacturers in the world are going down in humans and up in robots, which is causing thousands of jobs and ruining the economy. When thinking of introducing robots into the workplace, most people often think of unemployment. But what people don't know is that 38% of people in the workforce currently work with or on robots. But that still poses the question, is there more, is the unemployment rate higher than there is people working with them? Uh, 
Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard University had the same question. And their research found that there was 12 million more jobs created than there was taken, with a total of 98 million jobs created since the creation of robots and 86 million jobs taken. Another disadvantage of robots is their very high initial investment cost. A used robot can cost anywhere between $25,000 and $75,000, and a brand new one can cost anywhere between $25,000 and $400,000. These prices can add up, and a survey taken by several company owners uh, stated that 16% said that this was their number one concern when implementing robots, and 53% said that this was one of their top five when implementing robots. In 1910, 2,821 coal miners lost their lives while working on the coal mine. Implementing robots into the workforce would improve safety. Having robots in the workforce instead of humans decreases, um, decreases worker injury by a ton. Having robots in the workforce would help make it so that there are less injuries caused to humans while working with in dangerous and hazardous situations because robots can work in those situations easily without causing any harm to other people which makes safety one of the major pros of having robots in the world. Now, when you think about robots replacing human jobs and being implemented in our workplaces, you think of products being released quicker. You get more, uh, you get more perfect products because there's no human error. But what you don't think of is the unemployment rate that is ensued because of this. And what's scary about that is when there's less jobs, you're, the economic downfall you see is incredibly large. For an example, um, when in addition to, not already the jobs have been lost, an additional 29% of jobs are estimated to be taken over by robots in the very near future. And as you can see by this picture here, one robot could easily take the jobs of four, five, six people because they just won't be needed anymore. And uh, this will kind of make the economy crumble because the unemployment rate will go up, you see people without jobs, and they won't be able to buy the products that are being made because people will be out of work. Uh, in conclusion, we had been given the scenario of a board wanting to know whether or not they should implement robots into their factories. We found, as, as we were researching, as Viola stated earlier, that quality and consistency, and as Regan stated earlier, productivity are two really big major pros to having robots in the workforce. As Noah stated job creation, and as I stated safety, are two more major pros to having robots in the workforce. We believe that the board should approve having more robots robotic manufacturing in their factories because it would improve quality, consistency, productivity, job creation, and safety. I'm going to be covering the difficulty of finding skilled workers to maintain the robots. When you implement robots into a factory, you need to maintain them on the hardware and the software side. So you need to find workers that can do these skills. But these are very specific skills, and the workers that possess these skills are usually harder to find cost would need a higher pay and would need more training, which means more total expended resources for the company. Also, in a study in, done in 2020 by the Workforce Institute, they found that 62% of hiring decision makers had difficulty finding skilled talent, and they also predicted that by 2030, there'd be a 6 million skilled worker shortage. Those numbers spiked after the COVID-19 labor shortage started. In conclusion, the cons of using robotics in industrial automation outweigh the pros because of their high initial cost of investment, possibility of economic downfall, replacement of human jobs, the many security risks, and the difficulty of finding skilled workers to maintain them. And this is why we would not recommend the Board of Manufacturing to enter robotics into the workforce.